love, we thank you, Lord, for this place where we come to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the message that you're about to give us. I pray that you'd make our hearts ready to receive it and to accept it and to live it. That your words would plant in us seeds that produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. I pray for every heart hearing this word, Lord, that you would plant these words deep inside our hearts, Lord. That your lives, that these words would change us and, and transform us and give us new beginnings. I pray this in your holy and precious name through the intercessions of the Holy Virgin Mary, the prayers of St. Mark and all the apostles and disciples and St. Mina. Make us worthy to pray, thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Just have a few announcements, so you guys can have your seats. Hey, guys. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, first of all, happy Father's Day, Father Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yam is going to go out to lunch next Sunday, June 28th, after Light and Life. Uh, details of where we're going to be going will be uh, coming out soon. Uh, second, prime time or the college group, also on the same day, is going to be going to Payway, so we'll make sure that Yam does not go to Payway as well. So if you want to join them, feel free. Uh, the final announcement is there's this summer basketball league for the church is coming up. Uh, the league's going to be on Thursday nights. Games start at 7 p.m., about 24 minutes, uh, divided into two 12-minute halves, five-minute halftime, approximately eight teams. It's co-ed, so guys and girls, feel free to sign up. Um, you can sign up actually in the back today. It's $25 per person. And it's a, it's a great time if you already have your team together. Uh, you can sign up the whole team at once. Or if you want to sign up individually, and you can get placed on a team. Okay? And I believe that's it. Starting this Thursday? Uh, it starts July 2nd. That's when the, games will, uh, the first game will commence. So. All right. <coughs> yeah, Egypt is playing U.S. today. Vote for Jesus. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. <clears throat> Over the last several weeks, we've been hearing how important it is to wait upon God. Last week, we talked about the American prayer, Lord, give me patience, and I want it right now. We talked about how we need to transform that prayer to, Lord, I'm going to wait upon you even if it takes forever. We talked about how when we wait upon the Lord, or sometimes God by force makes us wait upon Him in order to rearrange our priorities, to make us grateful for Him. We went through several points last week. Today I want to discuss what we're supposed to do while we're waiting. <clears throat> Maybe you're right, right now you're waiting for the right job, the right house, the right spouse, some type of prayer to be answered and you've been waiting and you've been waiting and you've been waiting you've been trying to be good and you feel like you're waiting too long and I think all of us may be convinced <clears throat> we're convinced that we're supposed to wait upon God and we're convinced that that's the right thing to do but when we're waiting what are we supposed to do what are we supposed to do every day while I'm waiting God to kick in his engines and start, start moving, start answering some prayers. The Bible provides several characters and several people who really waited upon the Lord. First one is Moses who herded sheep in the backside of the desert of Egypt for 40 years by himself. After being the prince of Egypt, he ends up killing somebody, runs away to the back desert and is waiting for God's next step and it took him 40 years and imagine Moses in his youth and in his strength and in his his intel in the height of his intellect he's thinking okay God I'm ready to do your mission 40 years later now he's 80 God says okay now we're ready to go he says it's too late I'm done I'm khalas hamut but God in the right timing was preparing him, was preparing the people, and used him. Also, some scholars say that St. Paul, after he spent three years in the desert of Arabia, people thought that St. Paul just went out there and did his thing. 
Some scholars say that he may have waited anywhere from seven years. Some scholars say 13 years before he actually started his mission. Imagine the great Saint Paul, after spent three years taking communion from the angels and from Christ himself and being fed by the Lord himself, didn't go out to his mission for seven years after that. Today we're going to take a look at Joseph of the Old Testament and see how he waited upon the Lord. Now here's a man that was parked by God for quite a while in several instances of his life, several different places and several difficult, difficult situations. I'm going to kind of give us a summary of what went on in Joseph's life. <clears throat> but God had two objectives for Joseph's life. Anybody back there with a computer? Maybe you can press next. Okay. Number one is he was building Joseph's character. And if you know anything about the story of Joseph, you think, man, it took a lot to build his character. Because he went through quite a bit. We're going to discuss all those things. Another thing is that he was testing Joseph's character. That's the normal process that God uses with the man or woman that he wants to use. He builds Joseph's character, and then he tested his character. The more that God wants to do through you as a Christian, the more he invests in your character building curriculum. So when God is investing in this character building curriculum, you're in this waiting period. and It, it, it kind of stinks, and sometimes it's tough, but at the end, we're going to see how Joseph ended up, and, I bet you, and I, we're going to see what he probably thought at the end of his waiting. The question that arises during these periods of waiting are, number one, next, okay. how will I respond? How will I respond, number one, and will God grow me through this? Will He raise me? Will He make me bigger? And will I look for an alternative, alternate route? I think most of us are familiar with God's approach in, in the young man's life. Number one, he was the favorite child among his father. His father had 12 sons. He was the favorite. He got the coat of many colors. He is the one that got to stay back and hang out with dad while the other guys went to go out and work. So God removed him from his father who favored him and from his brothers who hated him. We know that they took their brother they took his coat, they sold him as a, they threw him into a pit, and they sold him as a slave to one of the pharaoh's like leaders in his government. His name was Potiphar. Joseph ended up living in this house as a slave for several years. But God was with him, God was blessing him, and he ended up being extremely faithful. He became one of Potiphar's had servants, and then he entrusted him basically through him prospering and being so faithful. He entrusted him with his whole estate. Potiphar entrusted Joseph with the whole estate. And now he was able to do whatever he wanted in the house. He didn't even have to tell Potiphar. Joseph rose to prominence. He was from a lowly slave to the manager of a very wealthy house. Why? Why was this? Because God prospered him and was with him in everything. So I'm just going to go through some of the incidents in Joseph's life and then we're going to go through the message. And then God built into him a, the kind of faithfulness and character that any employer would prize in a worker. Joseph was faithful over everything. Potiphar didn't even know what he had in his house. All he knew is that Joseph took care of it. Everything was fine. He never did anything dishonest. Everything was running smooth. God was building in him. Strong character. And then we saw his rock-solid faithfulness when Potiphar's wife came and tried to seduce him. And he responded saying, How could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And then he ends up fleeing and Potiphar's wife is so embarrassed and she feels like because she didn't get her way, she ended up saying, telling her husband that Joseph 
seduced me, and all this stuff, and I even have his garment that he left behind. Joseph ends up in prison, which is God's next assignment. This is where Pharaoh's prisoners were kept. Pharaoh's prisoners, the people that sinned against Pharaoh, didn't get to stay in like the, the resort type of prisons that we have here in the States. The people that messed with Pharaoh had to rough it quite a bit. And then from the time Joseph arrived in Egypt when he was sold as a slave to the time that he became like number two in line in Pharaoh's court was 13 years. 13 years disowned by his father, betrayed by his brothers, betrayed by Potiphar's wife and Potiphar, put into prison. Finally, at the end of the 13 years, he ends up becoming number two in life. He sat and waited, and I'm sure he sat and contemplated all the desires that God has for his life. Now imagine you're Joseph. You're the faithful one. You're the one that doesn't sin when opportunity comes running at you. You're the one that God is giving dreams about how you are going to, all your brothers are going to be bowing down before you and you are the best star in the, in the heaven. He had all these dreams that God gave him all these promises. <clears throat> Shortly after that, he finds himself in a pit. Then he finds himself sold as a slave, shipped off to some foreign country. And now he's working as a slave. And then God blesses him and he's with him and prospers him. And he gets to the point where he's like number one in the house. And he ends up, next assignment, prison. And you look at Joseph and you wonder, what could this guy have been thinking? Thinking God must have some future out there for me. It's been 13 years. I wonder if we were in Joseph's spot, what we would have done. Many people, when Job was in the same boat, and God ended up taking away his children and his flock, and he ended up getting sick, and he ended up, everything was just messed up in his life. Everybody said, Job, curse God and die. Just curse God and die. There's nothing to live for. Don't wait upon God. Your God stinks. Your God stinks. And he didn't. He stayed faithful. He waited upon God. We know that Job had everything <clears throat> restored back to him and multiplied several fold. There's three ways that he could have responded. He could have responded in anger and bitterness. Potiphar's sleazy wife seduces him. And then what happens? He's Mr. Faithful. It says that Potiphar became blessed because Joseph was blessed. Everything that Joseph did allowed Potiphar's life just to become more and more blessed and fruitful and prosperous and everything was going great. And then Potiphar just listens to what his stupid wife says and sends me to jail. He could have been angry and bitter. He could have given up at this point. I wonder if we would have met Joseph 70 years later. We definitely would understand we definitely would understand if he was anger and bitter, it would be justifiable. He's been abandoned by his family, betrayed, enslaved, imprisoned. Nothing is good in this guy's life. If he would have cursed God, we would have said, you know what, man, I understand. I completely understand. You have all the right to curse God. You have all the right to deny God and say, he didn't do anything for you. He left you. He left you out to dry. Or he could have manipulated the situation. I think it's natural for any of us to try to do something that would better our situation, whether it means trying to find another job or even just talking smack about Potiphar and his wife and saying how sleazy and how slime buckets they are. And at least try to justify himself before everybody and say, I'm not that bad of a guy. This is what happened. We don't read of any accounts of him trying to manipulate the situation, trying to get out of prison, trying to go any other route, he trusted. He trusted and he stayed there. He, he's still a faithful servant and a manager, even when he goes to prison. He also could have forsaken God and the earlier dreams. God gave him all these dreams, all these revelations that he was going to bless him and that he was going to be the greatest among his brothers and that his brothers were going to bow down to him and that his father would even know how great he was. And his father did recognize 
And he could have held on to the dreams, or he could have forsaken all these dreams that God said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to be with you. Knowing that he's the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who the God of heaven and earth has been making all these covenants with, he could have come to a point and said, you know what, God? This is a bunch of junk. None of this stuff is true. None of this stuff is real. You're really not there for your people. He used God's waiting time to do what he knows is right to do. When he went to prison, he didn't mope, he didn't complain, he didn't say, why me? He stayed faithful and he began to serve in the prison and doing what he knew what was right to do. His character was already built and shaped into the man that just does the right thing. No matter what the situation, he had learned through all these periods that you just do the right thing. You just do what you know how to do, and I promise you, he believed that God was always going to be with him at the end of the day. He was, the person who trusts God sees affliction and waiting as times of growth. He held on to God. And he said, you know what? Lord, I know this may be a tough time. I know right now I can't see anything good coming out of this. But I believe you're doing something behind the scenes. I believe, Lord, that you're making me better. You're going to make the situation better. Thirteen years later, he got to see that. They grow because of deep confidence in God and what he's doing. People who don't trust God view waiting and affliction as basically attacks or threats to my safety and security. So in the time in waiting, when, when, when I feel like nothing is going right, maybe God is attacking me. I feel threatened. I feel like everything in my life is going to be disturbed. And I feel like, you know what? Enough. Again, I need to take matters into my own hand. The result of a pattern not trusting in God is turning your back on Him. And I think many of us have gone to a place where we've turned our backs to God, and we said, Lord, I'm not going to wait upon you anymore. When we lose trust, we start heading the other direction. All because we didn't learn that God was going to come through. Man, Joseph could have said, wait a minute. I've been good this whole time. I didn't do anything wrong. Even when Potiphar's wife, who chances are might have been a knockout because she was the, the wife of this rich man who was like big time in the government. You always look at the high officials in, in governments in corrupt countries especially. You see like you have this like slimy, dirty government person and his wife is this like super model woman just because that's just how life is with, with these corrupt people. And so this knockout it's coming and knocking on Joseph's door saying seduce me and Joseph should probably say you know what man I've been doing everything right maybe this is God's reward for me no he held on to God and when sin was knocking on his door he trusted he trusted but though he knew he knew it might get him into trouble trouble he stuck to God and I think a lot of us say Lord I feel like I'm not being treated fairly. Let me tell you something. God is not fair. God is good and He's gracious. He's not fair. If He was fair, none of us would have a shot in the dark at getting into the kingdom of heaven. If He was fair. If God did everything that was fair, He would never have to bless you and He would be justified in not doing that. Even He could punish you and destroy you and make your life a misery and he would be justified because of our sins. We deserve it. I thank God that God is not fair. I thank God that he's not fair and that he actually always knows what's right and at the right time. I bet you the other prisoners when he got to prison said, man, you need a new God. Your God stinks. Your God hasn't done anything for you and you're staying faithful? Where did you end up when you held on to God? In prison? You're no longer in Potiphar's house. You're no longer with your brothers or with your father. You're no longer the fulfiller of all these wonderful dreams that you had. Get a new God. 
Come on, man, just get a new God. Don't trust anymore. Move on. How did Joseph respond? Number one, he trusted God's character. So the account of Joseph's life is from Genesis 37 to chapter 50. And in Genesis chapter 39, 21, 23, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So the Lord was with Joseph and extended his kindness to him. The Lord was with him. Whatever he did, made him prosper. And he believed no matter how hard the circumstances got, God was always with him. Which was why he was allowed to be so successful in everything that he did. He went to Potiphar's house as a slave. He was faithful. He responded in faithfulness. God said, you know what? Because you're faithful in this time of waiting, you're going to prosper. And then you think, last time I did that, I ended up kicked out by Potiphar, sent to prison. This whole faithful thing isn't working. What did he do? He went and started working in the prison. He responded with faithfulness. He doesn't disengage. He keeps on going and holding on to God. He also responds by serving others. He's the guy on top of the prison, everything's under his authority, in prison, very unlikely. And what does he do? He serves others. When you're waiting upon God, the number one thing to do, number one, is to stay faithful. Stay walking and stay doing what you know is right. I think when times get tough, a lot of us, we tend to stray and go our own way and do our own thing. Not Joseph. Joseph held on to his God and he said, I am a son of God. I'm always going to be a son of God. And I trust that God is never going to leave me. I think all of us are thinking, man, what a foolish guy that he would wait that long, 13 years for somebody to answer his prayer to get him out of prison. He served others and it says, and the captain of the guard charged Joseph with, him, with them and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. He remained faithful. In this waiting period, when you're waiting upon God to do something, can you look outside of yourself and say, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I serve others? The Christian life is the life of getting your eyes from, stop, from stopping to being fixed on yourselves and being fixed on God and His purposes. God and His plans. God and all the wonderful things that He has for the whole world. We say, Lord, I want to be part of your great plans. We need to serve. We need to offer ourselves for the well-beings of others. Even in times of waiting, you're saying, but I'm the one that's suffering. I'm the one that's got everything working against me. You want me to serve others? You never know what being faithful and being honest and being a disciplined person will get you. And we're going to see what happens. This man was not consumed with himself. Again, he wasn't sitting around saying, why me? He just held on to God. He sensed his presence. And I'm sure, I'm sure he was continuously meditating on God's character. If not in his life, I'm sure he meditated on how God was faithful to his great-grandfather Abraham. Or Isaac, and the way that he came and gave Isaac lands and wells and all these things. And he prospered Isaac. And he blessed his father Jacob. And Jacob got all the blessings and promises of God. And God just kept on showering blessings upon Jacob. And everywhere Jacob went, his wealth increased. And he just became more prosperous. I'm sure Joseph meditated on God's character among his parents, among his grandfathers, and said, I believe this is the character of God. This is the he knew the character of God. I have a question. Do we know the character of God? Do we know how, how God deals with us? Or do we just have this skewed image of what God might do for us? Maybe, maybe God's out to get us. Joseph remembered God's promises. In 
Genesis chapter 40 verse 8 it says and they said to him we each have had a dream and there is no interpreter of it so Joseph said to them do not interpretations belong to God tell them to me please so earlier in his life he got these dreams that one day his brothers were going to bow down to him including his father and he ends up when he's in prison way later on in his life there's the baker and the cupbearer who come and they say we've had these dreams and we need somebody to interpret them he says dreams belong to God let me interpret them man Joseph you still think that God made those dreams for you in the beginning of your life you think that that was God's plan or those were God's revelations to you none of that came true Joseph why are you holding God why do you think that the interpretation of dreams is from God because he knew he held on to the promises and again this is something that we should just admire him so much and so being so inspired by the way that he waited upon God and that after all these years he remembers what happened to him 13 15 years ago and he's saying God I believe you're the interpreter of dreams I believe that you're working the key word for us when we're hurting or just waiting is not escape it's endurance In James chapter 1 verse 3 it says knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience in other translations the original word patience is actually endurance so the testing of your faith produces endurance so when God is testing your faith day in and day out and you feel like I can't handle it anymore you may not realize it but it's producing endurance in you that may result in some greater good later on down the road we have to understand that the testing of our faith produces endurance if you've never begun to discover God's promises and how to claim them like Joseph did, I highly encourage you that you would start now. How many of you open up the Word of God and search for His promises? So that when adversity comes my way, I can say, Lord, you said. It says right here. Are you a liar, Lord? Are your words not true? It couldn't be that. I believe that God wants each and every one of us, every day, to hold Him to His promises. But if you don't know His promises, you can't hold Him to Him. You can't say, Lord, you said, because we don't know what he said. This is a calling for us to go and study the word of God and get deep. Know the promises of God so that when you're waiting, you hold on to his promises. And you said, you said, Lord, all things work together for good to those that love you. To those who are called according to your purpose. You said everything's going to work out for good. So far, Lord, it looks like it stinks. But I believe that you're going to come through and that all things are going to work out together for good. These are the promises of God. He also recognized God's hand. Imagine Joseph is working in the prison. He's faithful. He's cleaning the place. He's ironing their clothes. He's doing what, everything he's got to do. He doesn't see any hope. And all of a sudden, people who might have the Pharaoh's ears say, we need someone to interpret our dreams. Excuse me? Did I hear correctly? You need someone to interpret your dreams? Guess what? I can interpret dreams. I've had dreams before that were revelations from God. I can interpret them for you. He started to realize God is working. God is doing something. What's funny is that how long it took God to get moving. He was ready to do his part. I'm going to interpret the dreams and do everything I can. He said, in three days, one of you guys is going to be killed. In three days, the other one is going to be restored back to his job. And here he is thinking, by the way, when you go see the Pharaoh, and he says, how did you know about this? Tell them who I am. Tell Pharaoh who I am. For two years, for two years after this point, they had forgotten who Joseph was. Man, Joseph, you're still waiting. You're in jail, and you think that God is working, and maybe this is something that God has got in the works two years later you'll get out two years later they're going to remember you look how amazing this man was that he held on to God and he said Lord I believe you're working I know it wasn't by chance I know it wasn't by chance 
that you allowed this to happen, Lord. I know that these guys who were going to go to the Pharaoh, I know they had dreams, and I know you gave me the gift to interpret them because I know that you're working, Lord. Be able to recognize God's hand in your life. Sometimes there's roadblocks in the way. When you're walking in line with God, it'll be clear and say, I know God is working this out. This is typical of God. This is how God is doing something. Sometimes these roadblocks are signs that He's working and that He's going to do something great. And you have to recognize how, the God, how God works. How He usually gets people through their hard times. So maybe things are getting, going pretty easy for you lately. Maybe you're not waiting. I'll tell you. Sooner or later, God is going to grow your character because He cares about you. He's going to build you up. He's going to test your faith. And during these testings of faith and the buildings of your character to make you better Christians, to make you better human beings, to make you more successful and prosperous and blessed people, you have to know that He's never going to leave you. and He's going to be with you. You have to hold on to His promises. You have to wait patiently and quietly. And in the meantime, do what you know is right to do. Stay faithful to God. To God. Serve others. Don't be selfish in, in times of adversity. In times where you feel like, I'm just waiting. Lord, I need patience. I can't do this on my own. You hold on. You say, Lord, I believe in your promises. I believe in who you are. It's time for you to get to know God's character. Grow in your trust of Him. It's going to come. If you haven't had to wait upon God yet, I have to break it to you. Because God loves you. And because God wants to invest in every single one of your lives. And He's going to build you to make you stronger, better people. He's going to do it. So you're going to have to learn what to do during it. Learn prayer. Learn to cling to Jesus. Learn to know His character. What does God do in situations like this? What do I do when I face a roadblock? You stay faithful, just like Joseph did. Let's look at Joseph and see what he did. After all this, he became second in line to Pharaoh. He had the ring of Pharaoh, which is basically, he had the Pharaoh's credit card. And he had the Pharaoh's say, whatever he wanted to say, he could say it. And whatever he wanted to do, he could do it. I bet you Joseph, if you ask Joseph, Joseph, man, was it really worth it? The 13 years of slavery and prison and al araf al was it worth it? He says, look at me now. King of the world. I'm king of the world. Literally, he was king of the world. If it wasn't for Joseph getting to that prison, he would have never been in that place, in the right place at the right time. It was God's timing. Let's just say this happened seven years before. It wouldn't have made a difference. Maybe the cupbearer and the baker were not going to be in prison at that time. He would have had no dreams to interpret. God had his perfect timing and he lined everything up for his good. For his glory and for Joseph's glory. Believe it or not, God cares about your glory. Christ in his priestly prayer in John 17, he says, Lord, glorify them as you've glorified me. He cares about you. He wants you to be glorified too. He cares about these important things in your life. But you have to know that. You have to hold on. You have to cling. And you have to say, Lord, I pray that at the end of this waiting, I'm going to be the prince of Egypt. Something great and something awesome is going to come out of this. No father, no brothers, no family. No altar at Bethel in Israel. None of that, Lord. Here I am going through a tough time. I always tell people, when people say, how long do I wait? I always tell them, take 15 steps ahead and look back at your situation. And say, imagine what, what good you want God to do through all this. And look back and say, see everything that God did in your life good and bad, and I want you to try to understand maybe why he's doing it. Always take 15 steps ahead and look back 
and saying, man, some of these crosses that I held were for my good. They made me stronger. I needed to get through this adversity so that when I get promoted, or I needed to be able to be faithful in Potiphar's house and prospered in, in Potiphar's house and learn how to manage a house so that when I'm king of Egypt, I know what I'm doing. God allows tough times and builds your character for your own good. This is why we wait upon Him and this is how we wait upon Him. We respond in faithfulness, in serving others, and holding on to His promises quietly and patiently, recognizing His hand. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, Lord, I pray, each and every one of us who might be waiting for you, might be waiting upon you, trusting, Lord, in your good character, trusting, Lord, that you have something good that's going to end up at the end of all this, Lord. I trust, I trust that each and every one of us, Lord, will, you're going to give us the grace to hold on you, to cling to you, Lord, and to cling to your promises. Lord, you know how sometimes going through the fire is hard. But grant, Lord, grant us the grace to not, not take matters into our own hands, but to trust in you. And Lord, if we haven't had to wait upon you, Lord, I know that it's going to come some point in our life because you love us and you want to invest something good in us. You want to make us better. You want to glorify us, Lord. Give us the strength to walk in your ways. Teach us your paths, Lord. Teach us how to walk according to your plan and not according to our own. I pray for all my brothers and sisters who are clinging to you and who are waiting for you, Lord, to come through at the end so that you can do some glorious, glorious thing to fulfill your glorious plan for each and every one of us. I pray this in your holy and precious name through the intercessions of the Holy Virgin Mary and all the apostles and disciples and through the prayers of St. Mark and Saint Mean and all the saints make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespasses and now the love of God the Father the grace of the only begotten Son our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you go in peace the peace of the Lord be with you all amen and or happy Father's Day for all you fathers out there take care of your dads today make them happy